topics in HR. Whether it's passive talent or it's active talent. That's a soft skill that really gets undersold in the hiring process. How to manage in the virtual environment. You get a diverse cultured group of people. It's a win-win for everybody. More conversion from candidate leave. What does that look like in this new virtual world? Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another episode of Talent Experience Live. Of course, your weekly look at the hot topics in HR, interviews with industry leaders, as well as my favorite hot new HR tech, covering everything that you need to know in recruitment, talent acquisition, and of course, talent management. Uh, Friendly reminder, we are live here every single Thursday at noon Eastern time. So if you are just joining us for the first time or the 27th time, uh, please feel free to chime into the chat. We love the interactions. I will kick things off with where is everyone from? Where are you tuning in from? Looks like we have Matt from California joining us as well as Brian from Connecticut. And while you are here, Don't forget to hit the like, subscribe uh, so that you never miss an episode. And if you have to hop off because people like to double book on your calendar, feel free to catch the recap at phenom.com backslash resources. We always do a blog and you can always find the replay on YouTube under the Phenom People YouTube channel. Today is an exciting topic. It is how to avoid becoming a corporate catfish and build an authentic brand. Now, when people oftentimes think of corporate catfishing, they think of people duping organizations with fake interviewers or fake hires. This is not about that. This is the whole idea of being true to your brand and being authentic. Between living through a pandemic and the stresses produced by a volatile social and political climate, people are emotionally exhausted. To show their support, Organizations are taking a stand by embracing empathy and transparency, but simply saying they're going to change is not enough. A foundational shift is obviously necessary. Um, So like I said, live every Thursday here on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, definitely join into the comment section as well as like and subscribe. Uh, But since you are here now, uh, I'm going to kick things off with an icebreaker. That was one of my New Year's resolutions. um, And I was having a discussion with my boss, Tom Tate, and I was asking him, what are you doing about music nowadays? I oftentimes think of music, remembering points in time. It'll bring you directly back into college, high school, whatever it may be. And as we enter 2021 uh, and a new beginning, if you will, hopefully we get through this pandemic, I want to hear what people are currently listening to so that I can associate that with the good days to come. Also, one quick ad before we bring our guests on today. Uh, We now have a TXL email address. So if you have any questions or would like to be on the show on a future date, feel free to email me at TXL at phenompeople.com. My DMs are open, so feel free to slide in there, and we cannot wait to have you join the show. Um, Once again, I am Devin Foster. Today's topic is all around corporate cat fishing. Uh, And of course, I would have to answer my own icebreaker question as to what music I'm listening to. And I've lately been on this Moses Sumney kick. I don't know if any of you heard of him, uh, but definitely check out that music. Uh, All right, enough with the pleasantries, enough with the long-winded intro. Uh, Without any further hesitation, let's bring on our two, yes, that's right, two plural guests today, special guests, Christine Kenzie, Senior Director of Training at Phenom, and Ellen Hughes, Customer Success Manager at Phenom. So, welcome. Welcome, both of you. How are you? Good now after that great intro music. <laughs> Seriously, it's exciting, thanks, right? A little, little like jazz time. <laughs> I, I always love it. It gets me, me pumped up. Um, well, ladies, it is tradition here on the show to always start off with a LinkedIn deep dive, uh, very similar to Hot Ones, how they do the final dab um, or an Instagram deep dive. I always love to find out how people got to their career 
that they are in today. Oftentimes, it takes a lot of twists and turns. Uh, so we'll start with Christine. Christine, how did you end up as Senior Director of Training at FINA? I don't know if you can help me figure that out. That'd be great. <laughs> Being entirely honest, I feel like I'm the poster child of the liberal arts college graduate who still doesn't know what they necessarily want to do when they grow up. Um, my my undergrad degree was in German literature, and people to this day ask me why, and I honestly can't tell them why, other than it just felt like a fun idea at the time. Um, so yeah, that's true. Uh, but my first job, my first real job out of uh, college was teaching eight-year-olds, and to this day, I swear that everything I've learned professionally, I learned teaching eight-year-olds, and that the hardest thing I've ever done professionally is teach eight-year-olds subtraction uh, with borrowing. Still don't know how I survived that lesson in my classroom. Um, but you know, after leaving the classroom, I, I stayed in education. I've I've always been a big you know educator in all that I do. No surprise, I do training here at Phenom. So I, you know, found my way through all the different places in education, um, college recruiting, and then ed tech uh, was really how I got into the corporate side of education. And in that world, really started to learn. Um, about the people side of business. I just didn't know it was a thing. I thought HR was compliance. I had a very limited understanding of it. Uh, discovered it wasn't just about compliance and fell in love with HR and uh, people organizations. And that's what ultimately brought me to Phenom doing what I do here. That's awesome. And it must feel like you at times are still teaching eight-year-olds because <laughs> you teach me uh, every now and again. And, and one other thing uh, that I, I, I wanted to mention, you made a, a final point there and it just escaped my mind. So it'll come back to me, I promise. Um, but Ellen, same question for you. How did you get to where you are today um, and what was your journey like? So it's funny, uh, Christine and I have a very similar background, you know, liberal arts. Um, I'm a Villanova grad. Um, and I actually, I graduated during the recession. So at the time, it, there were no jobs at all. So, you know, Christine talks about her first job working with eight-year-olds. I worked four different jobs. Um, I was a copywriter. Um, I was a running coach. Um, I, I was an athlete in college. So that was a lot of my experience. Um, I ran professionally after college for a little bit. Um, ran with Brooks uh, Shoes in the New York Athletic Club. So I had a kind of an interesting like transition from, from being in college to the real world. And uh, somehow, if you told me that I would be working in HR technology and, you know, working with data today, I would have laughed in your face back then. Um, you know, I was a political science major. I wanted to be a lawyer, um, you know, was a big fan of constitutional law. So I think that's a lot of why I enjoy kind of you know, the HR policy side of things. Um, over the years, I found myself working with software. Um, it's just kind of something I, I got and, you know, really enjoyed working with people more than anything. And I think whenever I talk to people about my background, that's something that always is has been consistent throughout my career, has been working with people in one way or another. And um, here at Phenom, I think, it was kind of serendipitous how I wound up here. Um, you know, I was a recruiter for a little bit and just reached out to our, our head of TA, Kessa Ward, and asked if I could get a job. And, you know, I had seen Phenom at uh, some other, um, you know, events and things like that when I was a recruiter. And I thought, wow, that really seems really interesting, HR and technology together. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I wound up where I am now. <laughs> Ellen, that is an awesome story. Uh, graduating from college, I considered myself a professional runner, but only for the fact that I was running from responsibility. Uh, nothing else, I didn't actually do any running, um, but <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, it, uh, Christine, you mentioned uh, that idea of thinking of HR as, as just the compliance. And I know from my history as a recruiter, uh, oftentimes when, when somebody would act up in the office or make a joke like, oh, I'm telling HR, they'd come to me in recruiting. And I'm like, I have no idea about compliance <laughs> or rules. I'm, I'm here to you know, hopefully find people the right job. And uh, nobody ever came up to me and asked me if I could get a job, Alan, like you did to Kessa. But that sounds like the best day of work as a recruiter is being like, hey, I want a job here. Can, can I help you out? Mm -hmm. um, so before we jump into the, the meat and potatoes of today's episode, no one gets out of TXL without making it through the icebreaker question. So quickly, 
What are you two listening to through the pandemic? Ellen, we'll start with you. Oh my God, this is the worst question ever. <laughs> and so um, I, I love music. Um, you can ask my husband, I'm always playing music in the house. Um, I'm a big Spotify user. Um, so I make monthly playlists, uh, different themes. And right now I'm listening to, so I just like the vast majority of our country, um, <laughs> I joined Peloton um, okay. during the pandemic. And if you've ever been on Peloton, I don't have a, the bike, but I use the app and the music is awesome. Uh, the playlist that everybody curates on there. So right now I'm listening to one of Tunde's playlists and highly recommend it. But my right. tastes are so across the board. And um, if you ever want some Spotify recommendations, we'll have to connect. Absolutely. <laughs> Same question for you, Christine. Yeah, uh, I also uh, joined Peloton during the, the pandemic and <laughs> love Spotify. Again, Ellen and I have a lot of similarities. Um, but the difference is that I'm a bit more of a, like find something I love and stick with it. And so during uh, during COVID, I found a playlist on Spotify. Uh, it's the Smashing Pumpkins Mayonnaise playlist. And I love it, uh, have been addicted to it. Uh, and I love that it just, it has everything from like Maisie Star and the Velvet Underground to Iggy Pop and Foo Fighters and everything in between. And I just, I listen to it and it puts my mind at ease and I can get into a flow state, whether I'm, you know, outside on the deck, enjoying the weather on the weekend or working on content at, you know, at my desk during the day. <laughs> I just kind of like put it on and it transports me to another place. There you go. That is a, a beautiful aspect of music. It always brings you uh, to your happy place or whatever mood you are in at that point in time. Um, and I, I think that it maybe perhaps some of the music that you've listened to could be a silver lining for 2020, introducing people to new things. Um, but also, it's been a difficult year for pretty much everyone, right? Uh, no one was an exception to 2020, except maybe Peloton, it sounds like, since that seems to be very popular. Um, but what is another silver lining that organizations, uh, specifically in the HR department, can look back on in 2020 um, that you've heard or, or perhaps seen, Christine? Yeah, uh, I love this question, um, probably because it really taps into a, a topic from the education space that I get really excited about, which is that 2020 really forced all of us to do some, some deep unlearning. Um, we had to challenge our preconceived notions and assumptions about just about every part of our lives, right? And I think that the idea of having to like unlearn something or to question preconceived notions can feel really hard and as humans, we're just sort of hardwired to like routine and like habit and, and that can be really good and beneficial in a lot of ways, but it can also be really detrimental when things just become the norm because they've always been that way. Um, I just, you know, I, I think about the fact that how many of us have friends we just didn't stay in touch with or that, you know, you just couldn't get schedules to align. So you never went out <clears> to dinner, or you never got together for the weekend. And I have a friend group where um, because of, you know, small children and nobody can find babysitters or wants to pay for babysitters. We just never saw each other. And now we convert board games into online experiences and hang out from the comfort of our couch and, you know, grab a, a glass of wine and see each other. Uh, if we can rethink, you know, our lives in that way, we can rethink work in that way. We can rethink community. Um, and I think that, you know, companies have a, a really great opportunity to question what, work looks like, what, uh, you know, organizational culture looks like, how you experience it, uh, all the things we're going to talk about here, how to develop really authentic brands. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we no longer have the excuse that we don't know how to challenge those assumptions because we've clearly been forced to do it in 2020. Absolutely. I, I think back to kind of the, the way, you know, corporate happy hours used to be and things like that, where everyone would get together and they'd, they'd go to a place yeah. or uh, go to a Dave and Buster's and play games. And we couldn't do that. So one thing I know that Phenom did was was created Phenom Cooks, which was, you know, just a big Zoom meeting with with people sharing their secret recipes and, and maybe leaving a couple of things out as far as secret ingredients. <laughs> um, but we can completely reevaluate that when we end up back in the office. I mean, how many workplaces have kitchens or kitchenettes, right, where you can bring in something and potentially do that in an environment that is probably healthier than drinking, let's be honest, and, and may create a more HR friendly environment. Uh, no career limiting moves happen when people are just 
just cooking, right? Um, and Tom Tate, friend of the show, chimes in. He said he's still listening to Christmas tunes. And that is the perfect segue, I think, to the next question, which is all around fatigue, because Christmas took a lot out of me, right? You had to say who you were going to visit, maybe who you weren't going to visit. And also waiting on packages to get delivered was a bit more challenging this year. Um, so Ellen, when we think about the toll and the fatigue that everyone has had to, to really overcome. Um, what are some of the effects that uh, this fatigue has faced and how can leaders uh, and individuals combat that? Oh man, this is such a good question because I mean, even before the pandemic, we were all talking a lot about burnout, right? I think, you know, our country all around the world really, um, you know, how we work today, especially here in America, we don't, we don't really shut it off. Um, you know, work-life balance has always been kind of an issue. Um, and I think it's really up to organization, organizations and leaders, especially to kind of lead by example. Um, you know, a lot of things that we talk about internally, especially on my team, um, you know, you walk the walk. Um, for example, if you need to, you know, step out to go to a kid's concert or, you know, doctor's appointment or, you know, leadership needs to be doing these things in order to show their employees that, hey, we need to establish these boundaries and it's okay to take the time off. We have been on, we have unlimited vacation and, you know, I'm guilty of really not taking vacation days ever. Um, they're there and they're available. And I think, you know, a lot of places you find that, you know, some, it, it, it can be, you know, it can be hard to take the time off, especially now when we're home and there is no break in your day, you know, commuting to and from an office. There's no definitive start and stop these days. So it's exhausting. And I think, you know, like our leaders, I think do a really good job at Phenom. And I've seen a lot of, you know, leaders out there who have been really encouraging employees to take the time and, you know, establish those boundaries. And this goes beyond work too. Um, and this is something I've been reading a lot about recently, especially with the pandemic. And, you know, it's, it is exhausting, right? Um, not just the pandemic, but everything else going on in our country. Um, you need to establish boundaries in order to help fight that fatigue. It, it reminds me of uh, an episode that we did very early on in the pandemic with Brad Goldwer, uh, Chief People Officer at Phenom, uh, about potentially this idea of a staycation or, or how to take mm -hmm. time off. Um, and the reason why we did it early on was because uh, trust was, I think, think something that everyone really needed to, to figure out in this landscape, right? Um, immediately when, when I, I know I was guilty of this, when I thought people were working from home, eh, they're, they're probably not really working, right? Are they logging in at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, to just keeping to that hour lunch break and then, you know, signing off at five. Um, and I think it raises a really big question um, for, for Christine is, are people productive from home? You know, are they working that full day? And it, with so much going on, are we getting the best out of our employees? Uh, they may be the caregivers for, for children or elderly or even sick individuals. Um, you know, they may have pets that they have to take out on walks, you know, on a regular basis. Um, they even have new co-workers also called significant others. Is that a distraction throughout the day within itself? So how do you build this trust and, and how um, do, you, do you really in, incorporate that into your organization at all levels? Yeah, you might regret asking me this question. Because <laughs> I'm about to flip this question back on you, which is to ask, um, were we even productive before COVID when we were in the office? Uh, you know, and what does productivity look like? What does it mean? Um, and, and ultimately, I think I, I've, to Ellen's point, I've been doing a lot of reading during COVID. Can't really go many places, so <laughs> there's a lot to read. Uh, and I was recently reading some articles from Forbes and Vice and others about remote work and just work in general. And this idea that like what we understand work to be today we've just sort of, we take for granted, like we've learned it over time that you work nine to five to, to point out, Devin, your comment, like you sign on at eight, you have a one hour lunch break, you get off at five, um, that we work a five day work week, that these are just norms that we uh, accept as, as okay. Um, if you go back to like hunter gatherer society, 
people worked only as much as they needed to work to gather the food they needed to survive. And then they spent the rest of their time um, really it, living their life uh, as they needed to. Um, and I think that you know, when it comes to thinking about what productivity means and what it looks like and, and where we do our best work, trust is a really important part of that conversation because for some people, being home might make it more productive. They might be able to define more boundaries for themselves or introverts or those who are distracted by open office layouts and people everywhere might find more time for focus. I know managing a creative team, it's it's funny, I've, I've seen both sides of it. I have people who say it's great when you're home because you don't have as many distractions and you can actually get some of that creative work done. But on the flip side, you know, we miss the whiteboarding and the the quickness of being able to to you know exchange ideas and brainstorm to move us past a blocker, and you know all of that leads into productivity. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I I'm a personal advocate of you know productivity is relative in some ways. Like what is product what what makes for a productive environment for one person may not make for a productive environment for the other, um, and how we measure productivity. Uh, is is something that may be less important than how we measure the the results and the outcomes. Can we look at results based tracking and think about what am I asking you to accomplish? Do, do you have to spend eight hours, you know, working today if you can accomplish those things that we need you to do to achieve our goals? Um, I think it's why a lot of a lot of organizations are talking about should we move to four day work weeks? I know it's a controversial topic. Uh, you know, you can see both sides. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, trust starts with having authentic conversations, with being transparent, um, with good coaching from managers to their teams, being able to help people um, reflect and try to be aware, um, understanding if you don't meet a deadline or if you are struggling with something, where are those struggles coming from? Is it internal? Is it external? Is it that you're not seeking help? Is it that, you know, there's blockers you're not aware of? And in those authentic coaching moments and sort of support support structures that you can build, you can create really good productive environments in, in any medium, really. And we had a, a great comment come in from Shrinvasa, I believe I'm saying that correctly. If not, I apologize. Uh, while productivity might be better now or just might be the same, the problem is creativity as people don't get to spend time together and exchange ideas. And a friend of the show, Tom Tate, chimes in and says he's yet to find a true remote replacement for getting smart people in a room with a whiteboard, just cre creatively mm -hmm. tackling an agreed upon challenge. And I think that this is so important and why we've seen the influx of uh, messaging applications like Microsoft Teams, like Slack, and the built-in video capability of those uh, with, I think one of them even has like a whiteboard portion of it that you can do. Um, and it, uh, Christine, back to your point of are people even productive at work? I know probably 90% of Phenom felt that I wasn't productive at work because I would go in the middle of the day and take a run. But back to uh, uh, the, the previous comments, that's where I got my creativity. That's where I, I got to step away and do that. And then, I, of course, I'd come back and take a shower in a, a public locker room, which sounds taboo at this point. Uh, let's be honest. I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Um, but uh, no, this is, it, 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 they're all great points. I see Natalie chime in with missing whiteboards. I think all of these things are, are super important. Um, and it's going to come with a, a healthy combination of, of both, right, in the future of this remote workforce as well as um, this in-person workforce and how to combat that. And we're going to tackle that in a little bit. Um, but my next question, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to build on something you said, um, that, that idea that like you took a run in the middle of the day and that's how you got, you know, creativity. If I go back to this idea of productivity, another thing that I've been reflecting on a lot um, is that what we define as productive uh, is also really interesting. You know, when I when people mm -hmm. think about being productive, they often think <clears throat> about output, like I finished this task or I did this deliverable. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that taking a walk, going for a run, reflection, mindfulness are incredibly productive things to do because they make you more productive. They they bring to the surface those those things that are like buried deep inside of our brains. And it, it's also an opportunity to challenge our definition of what a productive day looks like. And it could mean taking 30 minutes to sit with your thoughts and, and be mindful and reflect. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's like saying you, you can't pour from an empty cup. 
right? And and you hear that phrase all the time. And it's it's to fill up. You might need to get outside, take a walk. Our our CHRO uh, Brad will often say, just get outside, take a few minutes. I'm lucky. I have a dog who you may hear at some point. I'm not sure. He tends to participate, and even my own customers know him. Uh, Miles, the dog. Anyway. Um, Miles and I will go take a walk during the day. And I can't tell you how much that has helped me. And I mean, I'm usually thinking about work. Same, Devin, I used to see you run past my desk, literally, uh, in your running clothes. And I thought, oh, that's such a good idea. I used to do the same thing. I would get out in the middle of the day and go for a run. And oftentimes I'm thinking about work, but then I come back to my desk and I, things are just clear. Um, so I think it's it's important to for for leaders to you know at organizations to encourage that sort of thing. Um, I think it's it's great to lead by example in that way. I'm gonna I'm gonna raise a challenge to those attending. Um, I used to do this a lot in my old uh, company, and I, I should get back to it. I'll I'll accept my own challenge. Uh, take a walking take a walking call. Right, you know the next mm -hmm. time you have a, a a call that's a one on one or a call where you don't need to be sitting in front of your uh, computer, just, you know, put your headphones in, take it uh, on the go and see what it does to your, your creativity. That's, that's awesome. And, and Natalie chimes in running clothes, what running clothes? I'm <laughs> glad that you use that term loosely. Uh, well, we can tackle that another day. Or if you see me on Broad Street in Philadelphia, you'll, you'll totally understand that joke. But uh, just an analogy there that, that I wanted to share immediately popped into my head is we talk about these, these athletes all the time. Sports is one of my favorite pastimes. And productivity is often views in wins and losses. But if a player is injured, just them showing up to work may hinder the team because they're not able to perform. And we have to look at that in the same sense of, of mental capacity, I think, in the workplace where you need to take a step away, maybe take a day off or, or take a walk uh, in order to get back to that 100% and truly be productive. Uh, otherwise, you, you may be hindering your team. Um, but Moving on, as we, we turn the page on, on 2020 uh, to look forward to hopefully a, a new and better year with, with shiny rainbows and bright lights and the whole nine, um, what challenges do you think we'll still face? Obviously, it's not going to be uh, as easy as we all think. Um, so Ellen, I ask you, when we, we talk about corporate catfishing and the idea of showcasing an authentic brand, what challenges will organizations face in 2021? Oh, such a good question. And I think First thing is, I mean, acknowledging how difficult the previous year was, I think recognizing how hard it was and talking about how hard it was um, to go off what Christine said earlier, um, sharing perhaps our failures or, you know, being transparent and sharing what was difficult. Um, but going into 2021, um, you know, I think what we learned from 2020 is that there are some things that we can do at organizations that may, you know, be simple check boxes, say, for example, you know, hiring a certain percentage of women or black people or whatever, whatever uh, demographic you're looking for in order to meet certain metrics. But the flip side of that is getting people to stay. Um, you know, inclusive cultures, that's the really hard part. And I think that there's never really a great answer for that. Um, the easy wins, so to speak, are meeting those metrics and they're easy to share in things like press releases and, you know, on your career site or, or anywhere else. But that, that inclusive culture is, is really the big challenge, I think, going into 2021. Um, you know, it's, kind of going back on what what you all discussed last week in you know this woke washing so to speak um i think going forward with what's going to be the big challenge and what what organizations will need to work on is actually living up to these things that they've talked about in 2020 from summer going forward no i i love that idea and it reminds me of uh, you two will both probably appreciate this, elementary schools, right? Uh, maybe third or fourth grade where a, a new student joins from another district and immediately there is this idea of, okay, everyone welcome the new student to the class, right? That idea of, that's orchestrated by the school. Uh, you do your introductions, you're not normals if you go to Phenom school or something like that. Um, but the, the idea of that individual then 
really becoming a, a part of the school itself, making friends and, you know, hanging outside of school. For some reason, when we fast forward to our adulthood, that seems to, to go away, right? Where uh, they're not included in, in happy hours. They're not included in some sorts of things. So those challenges of uh, understanding that you need a diverse workplace, whether it be diverse of thought or diverse of, of background, religion, uh, skin color, whatever it may be, but that idea of acceptance um, throughout uh, the, the, the workforce and not just throughout the hiring process. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we are live with Ellen Hughes and Christine Kenzie talking about corporate catfishing. Um, we're getting a ton of great comments in the chat. Uh, Christine, you'll appreciate this. I saw that Anthony Weber said challenge accepted for taking some of those calls on a walk. Um, and uh, a, a lot of great comments from Natalie, Tom. So thank you all for joining. Uh, as we continue along, uh, Christine, this next question is something that I find super interesting as we, we enter 2021 in the new year. Uh, when we look at returning to the office, whether that be near or far, depending on what you know organization you're in or, or what industry you're in, um, how should companies evaluate both comfort level as well as flexibility of their workforce, whether they're comfortable coming back um, you know, in a, an environment where not, maybe not everyone is vaccinated, as well as now they have this added aspect of they have to take care of, you know, some elderly or maybe children or, or anyone else in their, their organization. So how should companies look at um, really attacking that in 2021? Yeah, um, um, that's a, it's a tough question in, in some ways, but I also feel like it's sort of an easy one. My, my gut just says ask. Uh, you know, go to the the easy answer. Back, you know, back to my third grade teacher days. Let's we'll simplify <laughs> things a little bit. Um, but honestly, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind when you ask that question is when for those organizations, and, and I think we have to be clear that the idea of returning to work is is true for certain types of organizations with certain workforces because there's a lot of people who have been there uh, day in day out and and it hasn't changed uh, if if anything their their challenges of of work are different for frontline workers and and healthcare workers and other places but i do think that um, one of the things that becomes important for us to understand to ellen's point is you know when it in thinking about our communities and our cultures and, and being inclusive is about balancing people and, and profits and thinking about what's ultimately the strategy and the objectives of the business at, at, a, at a profit level and a business level. But then how do we um, provide sort of authentic choice uh, and build on that trust and create those, those cultures that allow for our people to be honest about what they need and that we're really listening to what they need or just simply what they want. We've now, you know, for Phenom, we've been home for a year, <laughs> almost, <laughs> coming up on a year. And for a lot of people who have never worked from home before, it's been a challenge and they are itching to get back. For other people, it was a discovery of something they love and uh, it, it's not a need, it might just be a preference. And I think that this goes back to my, my conversation earlier around productivity and results-based you know, tracking is, can we challenge our assumptions? Can we really think about if these are our objectives and goals and strategies as an organization, can we put aside what we used to think was needed to achieve those and really reflect deeply on what we can do to create uh, organizational cultures and communities and structures that allow for some flexibility, that allow people to help define good boundaries, that, that ensure that they can um, you know, support the organization but be supported back by that organization. Uh, and so I think those questions need to happen at a leadership level, but we also have to engage our people. We all have blind spots. We all think that we're trying to be, you know, employee centric or understand all the perspectives. But until you ask, you just don't know. But you're also not going to get an honest answer if you haven't created a place where trust and authenticity is allowed. So I think they all they all kind of go hand in hand, which is why, as Ellen said, it's the hard work. Um, but if you can leverage those those systems and, and that trust and that and that community, you'll be able to make decisions that will allow for the organization as a whole to thrive, not just parts of the business or not just profit to go up. 
Yeah, asking really opens up those lanes of communication and then it's that's only half the battle. You have to continue to build that to create a, a safe and, and trusting place. Building on that, as well as uh, this, the topic of inclusivity in 2021. Uh, Ellen, my next question is for you. Uh, obviously, we've seen polarizing opinions on, on mask wearing in the, this country. We've all seen viral videos uh, as well as the vaccine and everyone is entitled to their opinion. Um, but when we think about uh, an organization as a, a living thing with lots of different components and, and moving parts, people are going to have different opinions. So when you look to returning to the office, how can organizations uh, have discussions similar to, to what Christine is talking about, keeping in mind everyone's safety and views? Because I think for the most part, we all do want to get back to an office and in that safe place where we can run in the middle of the day uh, and, and wear whatever we'd like, right? So how can uh, organizations really have those conversations around such hot topic or hot button issues? I think that to piggyback off of what Christine said earlier is ask. I think listening to your employees, uh, finding constructive ways to either poll them or survey them to get anonymous information. You know, surveying your employees is a really great way and also encourage reassuring them that their responses, regardless of what it is that you're asking of them, are anonymous so that they feel like they can safely ex truly express their opinions, their needs, et cetera. Um, and then picky and then uh, add that to also regular uh, communication from leadership um, throughout, for example, throughout the pandemic, when they, as Christine said, we've been home for almost a year now, um, you know, starting in March of 2020, our leadership ha held all hands meetings virtually around the world and communicated vital updates to us clearly, um, had beautiful slides to help demonstrate really, you know, heavy things such as, you know, what, what they, you know, what our budgets look like going forward, realistically, what can we expect, you know, for our business going forward? I think things like that help one, calm employees down, communicating, communicating, communicating as often as possible, clearly, um, and providing different ways to do that through surveying, through, you know, all hands type meetings, um, trickling it down through, you know, mid-management and making sure that the messaging is clear and consistent across your organization. Um, that way, on the flip side, you have your employees feel that they can come to their managers or you know, go to leadership if they have any issues or questions or wanna share opinions or concerns, especially when it's to things like you know, very polarizing issues these days, such as mask wearing and uh, social distancing, et cetera. So, Opening and that's something I, you know, in general, I think, you know, to go back on what we were saying earlier about silver silver linings for 2020. Um, in the past, you know, in person, a lot of times, um, you know, most people in organizations didn't have direct lines to leadership, and you know, instead maybe you heard from them in you know town hall type meetings or all hands type type meetings, but. Um, and maybe you'd see them passing in the halls if you were there in person, but something about being at home and being at our computers, it's its a lot easier to access these folks both ways, right? So in this case, you know, employees now have a, in my opinion, have more direct access to leadership. So, you know, for instance, when, uh, I mean, I would say throughout June or the summertime, Christine and I uh, joined up and we are part of a, a diversity and inclusion task force. And the reason for that is we were able to speak directly with our leadership about, hey, we need to do something. We need to say something. We need to provide outlets for our employees, um, you know, either to volunteer or to impact uh, the talent acquisition space, et cetera. Um, to, you know, for ideas for our products relating to diversity and inclusion. And since we were home, it was just so much easier. You could go on Slack and form a group and, you know, speak directly to our CHRO and, you know, head of TA and VP of HR. So long-winded way of saying that, you know, going into 2021, um, you know, I think that's going to be uh, something we could see. 
No, and, and Tom chimes in in the, the chat with lead with the truth and this idea of, of corporate catfishing and this idea of really being transparent um, and, and being okay with not knowing what you don't know. Uh, I think that is the best thing that you can do as a talent acquisition professional as well. Um, so when we, we think about be honest with internal employees, it's also uh, equally as important to be honest with those outside of your organization. <laughs> Uh, if you you know were on or potentially still are on a a pay decrease, let people know who are interviewing. If you did unfortunately have to furlough and lay off individuals uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, let people know. Um, they'd rather hear it from you than read a bad glass door recommendation or something like that. Uh, so it really just showcases your organization as well. Um, Ellen, another question for you. You mentioned asking, um, and I know, Christine, you did as well, uh, but how frequently should leaders uh, ask what's working and what isn't to their uh, their workforce because things are changing so fast? I mean, it was just this morning, I was listening to the radio, they said COVID cases are down in 38 states. Who knows, they could be on the rise tomorrow. Um, so when things are changing so rapidly, how frequently should leaders look to ask their team on, on what's working and what isn't? Well, I think, you can't ask enough. I think that showing that and asking often, you know, either through small surveys or just polls, or even as part of your one-on-one -on -one meetings between managers and, and employees. Um, so it's getting feedback continuously all the time, I would say, you know, frequently, it, it shows how important it is to the organization that, that you have these regular, not just often, but in multiple ways. I think it's it's important to show not just you know surveys and things like that, but a, like I just mentioned, one on ones, uh, meetings, th things like that, or even casually, um, you know, like I said, people are really accessible now using you know messaging or or you know Zoom meetings or whatever. Um, I think asking often um, is the best way to go. Yeah, the idea of of one on ones and it not being a survey, I think, is is so important there um, because it is okay to not be okay during this time. And if you, as a leader, express that to your team or even a specific individual during your one on ones, that's going to go a long way to building that trust that Christine talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, Christine, this is uh, my next question is for you, and I, I think it's one that is super pressing for a, a number of organizations. Obviously going back to the office will be challenging, but so many companies have really looked at remote workforces in addition to their individuals who show up to the office on a daily basis. Uh, obviously, when we do return, the dynamic of, of what we're used to is going to change. So how do organizations who are adopting remote workforces, how do they maintain inclusivity in, in the workplace? Um, how do they make sure that those people who are located outside of the corporate office location are included in questions and discussions? Uh, it's, it's a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure I have all the answers or maybe any of the answers. <laughs> but, uh, but no, um, you know, I think the, I think that, you know, when you, when it comes to just I'll just say in inclusive work culture in general, because I don't think, you know, yes, having blended or sort of remote and co-located people together adds another layer to it. But inclusion in the workplace is a big topic and an important one to consider regardless of your workforce structure. And I, and I think that as we go into 2021, well, I guess we're in 2021, time flies in a pandemic. <laughs> now that we're starting 2021, um, right. it's, a, it's a great opportunity to do some reflection. Like, who were we as an organization before COVID, right? Like in 2020 and, and before that, um, what what did it look like from an inclusion perspective? Where, where are their strengths and where maybe were there weaknesses or gaps or opportunities um, that we needed to seek out? Um, who are we now, right? In this, you know, current COVID world, what does inclusion look like and mean? Where, again, where are we strong and where are are we weak? I'll think about, you know, Phenom in particular. Something that that comes up at least once a week for me is that there are people in Phenom that I have not spoken to for over almost a year now. Um, I used to see them in the kitchen. I used to interact with them casually, and I started to realize that. Um, I speak to people at work that I need to work with 
not the people that I work with, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to creating inclusive cultures, especially when you have a significant number of remote people, you really have to start to think about how do you ensure that people's networks aren't becoming smaller and that your space isn't becoming more similar because you're only interacting with the people that are directly related to you? How do you ensure that there is space to include other voices, other perspectives, and that you are aware of the needs of all of the people in your organization? Um, back in a, a prior job, I what I had, I had shifted my team from being fully co-located to having remote people. And I really had to think deeply about what that was going to mean from a mindset perspective. How do we make sure everyone's represented in the room when they're not physically in the room? Um, how do we make sure that knowledge is shared broadly across the organization, not just to the person who sits next to you? Um, and it really required the, those of us who were physically located near one another to take very like explicit action and be very aware of our tendency to exclude particular people or voices by nature of them not being physically present. How do we make sure to ask a question in the Slack channel for the entire team, even though we know that the person next to us probably has the answer, but we want the good of the group to have that answer? How do we connect during a meeting? Um, I used to make it a requirement in my old team that everyone connected from their desk for our team meeting, even though we were, some of us were in the same office because everybody then had an equal access point from a communication perspective. And those who were remote didn't feel outside of the room, so to speak, uh, for a meeting. Um, and so, you know, if you're, if you're asking yourselves these questions, who were you before, who are you now, and who do you wanna be? Um, and, and really asking your people and, and your organization to reflect on those hard questions and to challenge those assumptions and biases. Um, you, you start to engage in the process of being able to define what an inclusive workplace and culture is going to mean for everybody, regardless of how you're organized, whether you're remote or not. Um, and, and can start to question things like, what does gathering look like when you're not all together? Because gathering is an important part of creating inclusive spaces where people can share, be creative, um, you know, learn from one another and grow together. And how do you create gatherings that bring people together um, equally uh, and give people the space to be able to share uh, and grow and challenge respectfully um, and, and with transparency and authenticity? Um, the last thing I'll say that I think is important from an inclusion perspective for organizations that are sort of returning to work in 2021 is this idea of being really mindful of the need to integrate and reintegrate people. Um, there are people that I know at Phenom, we've hired people who have never set foot in our office. They've spent an entire year talking to other people and getting to know the organization, but they've never met face to face. Uh, it's kind of like online dating, <laughs> talking online, and then you have to meet in person for the first time, and you're hoping it goes well, <laughs> and that you're not being catfished, hence the, you know, part of the name of this, this uh, show. Um, I think organizations should really reflect on what that's going to look like and what that's going to mean. How do we reintegrate people who used to work together but haven't spoken for over a year? How do we integrate those new folks who weren't ever, you know, face to face and, and don't understand the dynamics of working in an office with all of these people and how does all of that sort of create an inclusive space? Yeah, I, I love that. And one point that you mentioned there was, was gatherings. And I, I saw Shrimpasa chimed in in the, the chat with have lunch together if possible, virtually or Fridays are an ideal uh, time to have one-on-ones. That way it's not about ticking the boxes. It's just about having a conversation. Uh, Anthony chimes in with being able to adapt to change and pivot when needed as an organization is a time of consistent change. Staying connected with your organization's lifeblood employees is more vital now than ever. Um, and then uh, Caitlin Hess, who chimes in, who's, who's new to Phenom, she says, and having no idea how tall everyone is. And on, on that se sentiment, <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten a haircut since March. So I am <laughs> sure that there are going to be people uh, in the organization who are not going to recognize me, which is shame on them because they should be watching the talent experience live and tracking the <laughs> progress of my hair. Um, but before we go, uh, ladies, uh, one word of advice that you would bring to people um, for their next meetings, whether it be at the C-level or 
even just a team meeting around this idea of, of building an authentic brand, not catfishing and preparing the future. A lot tied in there, um, but but just what would you want someone to, to hang on to from today's episode? We'll start with Ellen. <laughs> well, you use the word that that I was kind of planning to use, which would be being authentic, I think, and and leading by example. Um, you know, a lot of times in our team meetings, like I, I talk about, uh, you know, our team is transparent, um, you know, <coughs> respectful um, and is truly authentic. And I think, you know, the more that you show that you're being yourself, you yourself, you know, in meetings or or what have you, I think that kind of behavior and that mindset is contagious. And that's a good thing because people can feel, you know, safe and secure when they are, um, you know, need to share something important or concerns or, or you know, that 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 fosters that inclusivity that that Christine uh, was talking about in the last question. So um, you know, truly, not to sound cheesy, but really just truly being yourself and and being authentic when you're in team settings, it does make a huge impact. And Christine, same for you. Yeah. I'll build off of that and and say that I would encourage uh, everyone, you know, when you go to your next meeting or, or go about your day is to ask yourself, are you creating space? Um, is there space for um, authentic sharing, right? You know, is there space to, to be honest about where people are struggling or that they're struggling? You know, are we going into meetings and just focusing on getting stuff done and what the work is and what the tasks are? Or are we creating space for people to share, to, to support, to discuss, um, to reflect, to think about the fact that it's okay if you're not okay. I think Devin, you said that earlier, like it's okay to not be okay. Are we creating a space where, where we can communicate that, where people can feel that? Because I think if you're building this space for people to have this kind of dialogue, um, it, it goes hand in hand with trust. It goes hand in hand with authenticity. Um, and it's how you get honest feedback from your people. You have to make space for feedback to come to you. Uh, and you have to be very intentional in that. And I think that particularly in a remote um, ex sort of experience where it's a lot of asynchronous conversation or you're just kind of like jumping into things because you're just used to jumping into things from one Zoom to the next, it um, it can it can sort of fall to the wayside that idea that like there just isn't space to just be as humans. Um, we're you know people are the the lifeblood. I, I, as the quote was said from you know I think it was uh, Anthony. They're the lifeblood of our organizations, and we need to remember that um, and make sure that uh, that that's always sort of top of mind for us in all of our interactions. Yeah, I, I think creating that space and and really. Um, having genuine conversations with with everyone that you interact with, whether they're internal or even external. Um, you know, I, I think back to, to Monday mornings in the office. Uh, the first question that I would ask someone wasn't about what we have to do today for work or, um, you know, what needs to be accomplished. It was, what did you do this weekend? You know, it, it's really taking the time to ask them um, what their life is outside of work, because there are two sides of, of people's of lives inside work and outside of work. And I, I challenge recruiters and talent acquisition professionals to do that same thing when they're interviewing individuals is to ask them what they're doing in their during their personal time, because that's equally as important in, in making sure that they are going to feel included in your organization um, even before they start. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, that, that is my, my last little bit of, of analogies there. Um, I hope you both have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining the show. I can't wait to be back in the office with you. Hopefully we can do a recap on 2021 in the studio that we just built for this show um, before we were thrust into our homes. Uh, and I, I wish you both a, a wonderful weekend and hopefully you get some, some time away from your computer and go on a walk, right? Yeah, go on a walk. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. There you have it. That was uh, Christine Kenzie and Ellen Hughes. We were talking all around corporate catfishing, preparing for 2021, and how to remain authentic as a brand. If a question comes to you after the show, I mentioned at the top of the show, we have an email. It is txl at phenompeople.com. So feel free to shoot those over. Or if you are interested in potentially sharing some of your own thoughts, you can do that as well. And we will be sure to respond to you. Um, before we go, 
Uh, you're here now. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to Phenom, like our content. We're coming out with new stuff every single day, as well as a new episode of TXL every single week. Um, and if you haven't, by chance, caught last week's episode on Walk the Walk, Driving Systemic Change with DE&I expert Christina Cole, uh, Managing Principal at HR Computes. Definitely check that out. We mentioned it a couple times today during the episode. Um, and this clip from last week's episode, I think, fits right in. It is all around discussing woke washing. So we'll air the clip now. Well, I think understanding where you are and you know, as we if we go back to the continuum, understanding where you are on your journey relative to that, and then making sure your external messaging and your internal reality are are more in alignment than perhaps we've seen. Um, you know, a, a, as you kicked off the show, you talked about um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we've talked about political unrest, social unrest. Um, we've seen a lot of organizations, you know, post things in support of these movements. But when you look internally or, you know, you look on Glassdoor or, you know, today in the, the world that we live in, information is readily available. Um, everything is transparency. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, an organization could lock down its secrets that they didn't really want to get out. But today, that's very transparent and it's reported all over the place. And as soon as something happens, um, it's being tweeted. So it's, you know, you, you really have to be conscious of what you're saying to your customers, to your other stakeholders and making sure it is consistent and in alignment with what you're doing internally. And some of these measures can help you gauge where you are and you know, you're, if, you, if you are representing to a candidate community that they'll be, be very welcome in your organization and the a turnover for that particular candidate community's identity group is astronomical, um, you, you have a disconnect there that you really need to address and you need to be authentic in how you're going to address that. That was a clip from last week's episode with Christina Cole. Uh, so definitely check that out on YouTube or on the Phenom blog. Uh, as always, we will be live next Thursday uh, when we will cover video everywhere with Yair Lashim, VP of Platform at Kaltura, discussing crafting user-generated <laughs> content to connect with talent. I apologize. I'm struggling right now. Um, but as Christina Cole mentioned, uh, everything is transparent now. Everything is out there. And that is a key aspect to building an authentic brand. So hopefully you learned a few things today and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again.